Hi, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about team development. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the remote worker. I am going to inject a little bit of information around thinking about these times as we have teams, as well as those working remotely, because it is challenging right now, particularly for managers uh, and uh, people running businesses who are trying to keep those businesses running forward but also in the same breath, uh, being respectful for all the things that they personally are going through, uh, as well as those that work for them. So uh, I wanna make sure we leave enough time at the end for any questions that uh, you may have. I'll do my best to answer them. So team development really starts with you. Um, so when we start to think about when you sit with your teams and the people that you're working with, you know, have you really cast that vision of where do you want to take your startup? What's the problem you're solving out there as you develop your business? Um, what are going to be those key performance objectives that you have put in place for the next, say, six months, 12 months? In some cases, you're going to want to share where you're going in the next um, 18 months. Um, and that may fundamentally be based on, are you out in the marketplace generating funds uh, for your business? Um, some of the KSOs or the key strategic objectives you're gonna wanna be thinking about are gonna relate to um, what your shareholders are gonna be wanting you to do uh, around uh, customer acquisition, revenue growth, where's your product at? Um, and where do you want it to go? So those are going to be some of the key things that you're going to want to be thinking about um, as you kind of move forward um, with, with uh, where you're going. You know, the next area that I always like to concentrate on is related to employee performance. So what you'll find often when you speak to me is uh, I think talent is, is an interesting word that's used today among HR practitioners. But the truth of the matter is that uh, most uh, leaders are looking at uh, their financial performance, their product performance. So I tend to focus a little bit more on employee performance. Um, and where are you going? And, and back around 2014, um, when I was working in a tech company, um, one of my uh, HR uh, practice uh, people, we kind of broke the system a bit and we went back to the basics of doing a review at the end of the year is interesting, but it's much more effective when you think through where you want to go and then you start to think about what do you need people to do. So when you're thinking about whether it be recruiting or coaching your team or uh, really talking about the performance of your team, you want to start with really what we've just talked about is where are you focused as a leader? What do you need to achieve? And then really taking a look at what are the skills, the capabilities that you need within your team to be successful in what you want to develop against. Um, and so what I often suggest to people is that you start with the end uh, at the beginning, which is what are you trying to achieve? What do you need to have within your team as far as those skills and competencies? And then the next part of this is what do you have uh, you know, today that you can develop up within your team? Because one of the big things for employees today is being able to develop skills uh, and to be able to grow. So that's a fundamental basic of, of what they uh, want to see in a job and in a work environment. The other piece is then starting to think about what do you have to buy in? Um, so one of the guidances that I do give to people like yourselves is think about what you really need. It's so easy to go out there in the marketplace and buy very junior employees um, and sometimes the issue is that, um, you know, you're buying an, um, a, a resource that may not cost your business very much um, on the surface. But the problem is sometimes those people don't have all the skills and capabilities that you need in the beginning of your business. So just be thoughtful to the type of skills and the capabilities that um, you are looking for. Um, when you uh, are uh, out there. 
Um, once you kind of establish that you are able to hire and get the right people involved in things like that, then the next thing that um, you know I really look to is how are you developing and coaching your team? So whether they are in your building or they are working remotely, it's always important to make sure people know where you're going, what do you want to do, and what should I be doing to participate in moving the business along successfully. So those are often, you know, big issues for these people. What I do suggest is that you, once you know where you're going, you know you've started to have the right teams, then you want to start to get that coaching piece going. And one of the things you're going to find is that pretty much day to day, you are going to be um, spending time with the people that work for you. Um, so take those moments to really look at, you know, what is the work you need them to do? How could you provide that guidance or counsel on how they do it a little bit better or a little bit differently than what they are doing in order to be um, sort of meeting that standard of performance that you're looking for. And, and also in so doing, they're also growing their own capabilities and skills. So when you start to really think about, you know, where are you going? You're now getting the teams together. It's really about enabling your team and making sure that, you know, you've got them doing all the right things. So sharing your vision and letting people uh, get involved, creating a sense of team effort and results is always important. So you want to also, you know, this is part of the vision casting aspects of what a, a leader is about when they're running a business. So CEOs, presidents, founders, um, it's really getting people excited. You can't assume they will always be as excited as you will be unless you share that vision. Um, they want to be excited about where they're going. Um, divide up the work, align assignments to people with the expertise and for the development opportunities. So if you know that you've got people on your team that are very capable, you want to encourage them to teach others, to be able to do the work and to learn how to scale up. Because the reality is, as you become more successful, you will need more than just one person doing that particular job, whatever that may be. So we want to be able to scale up the team. Um, communications is key. So what we know when we're looking at empl uh, employee engagement surveys, um, you know, in businesses, uh, we know that there are three things that employees almost always without reservation uh, identify. It's, you know, I want to grow and I want to be recognized and uh, communications within a business. If you can start to get really good communication cadences going in your businesses, so you're vision casting and you're sharing where you're going on a regular basis, that can be quarterly or semi-annually or you know on an annual basis, I would suggest it's gotta be more than that. But then when you start to layer in that next layer around doing scrums and weekly communications and stand-ups and things like that, people start to feel part of what you're building. And they, and they participate in that. So communications is always uh, important. Enabling discussions as well. Um, there is a business uh, downtown, Guest Logic. Uh, I had the opportunity once to sit in on one of their town halls and I really kind of liked what they were doing because what they did is they used Slack. So although they were doing a town hall where the employees were there, the CEO was there, they used um, the Slack tools to uh, build conversations. Um, but what they were also doing is creating knowledge management databases as well. So one of the things they were talking about in that meeting that day was uh, around the product. Um, so they were sharing some information around from product development, uh, where the product was going. Um, so everyone had a chance to see that product demo that day. And then they were able to feed into a dialogue that was going on uh, in real time uh, to discuss questions that the CEO was asking about it, but also from different areas and different viewpoints of the business. Because I think having that diversity of perspective from where you come from in a business, your background in everything becomes really important. So um, those are kind of the things to keep in mind uh, as you build your communication cadence, because that also brings people together. Celebrating milestones and achievements uh, is important. 
So, uh, and I also talk about the fact that simple thank yous uh, are important from a recognition perspective um, and doing shout outs. Um, so CEOs and people like yourselves, uh, you're often quite busy. You're trying to do a lot of different things. And so it's finding simple things that you can do and sustain. So if you know that uh, you're on an airplane uh, because you're flying around uh, meeting with investors and doing the, the work with clients, um, and you know that you've always got um, you know a 30 minute window on an airplane, think about those quick little moments that you can uh, do an email to the team and go, hey, we had a great meeting uh, here in California today. Uh, and here's you know, two or three highlights of that. And here's some things we're really excited about where we're going to go uh, with next. You know, those are the things to remember that the achievements, uh, you know, getting that information from others around you, uh, moments that you can celebrate and really, you know, take on. Because what that also does is helps to teach others uh, how your business focuses, what is important and of value to you within the employee base. So it allows you to kind of build uh, and scale um, what those capabilities are within your business. And, you know, if my slides were working a little better right now, what we would also know is that, you know, basically on those three slides, if you do all of those things, you've got it. You know, you've built your team and, and you're having great success. But the truth is, is that things don't always happen as easy as they should. So as a consequence, um, sometimes uh, what we have to do is um, we have to um, adjust because what we find sometimes is that we're moving so quickly that we don't always have the ability to um, spend a lot of time uh, on these things. So what we find is that it's not unusual that uh, we end up with um, individuals. So uh, if we think about sometimes in a development team specifically, we have people who come from different backgrounds. Uh, they like to work differently. They've been um, uh, trained differently. So they have their own individual perspectives of uh, what, is, uh, what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. Um, and they work sometimes just a little independent. And that's where really ensuring that you're bringing groups of individuals together as a team uh, becomes quite important. Um, so I want to take a few minutes to talk about some of those things that you want to keep in mind. And I know that um, after this, you will get the full set of slides. So you'll be able to take a look at this in detail. But things that um, you know are important is that teams have a common purpose which is a little different than say a group of individuals uh, groups of individuals may tend to focus on the specifics of what they're doing but teams actually have common purpose so some of the things that you're doing are starting to integrate that common purpose um, into your business and into the work that they're doing you're mutually supportive these people don't typically, as a team, um, attempt to kind of personally gain or have turfs. Um, everybody's in it together um, and to achieve that common goal. And that's why it's so important as a leader that, um, you know, you are vision casting. You're helping to bring everybody together through your communications and the things and the communications and the, and the stories you tell. Um, ownership. Um, groups of individuals will often be about um, building little mini empires sometimes. Um, I, you know, this is mine. This is how I'm building my thing. Um, what we do know is that in a team, there is a sense of ownership around their jobs, around their departments, but they are committed to the values and the goals of the overall business when they're established. So they are moving together forward. Um, when you hear about cultures that have been built by leaders where everybody is in it together, um, it's the kind of uh, work that the leaders have done to really build that out. Um, I don't feel necessarily like I'm a hero within the business. I know that I'm someone who may be a leader, 
I may be a top performer, but I also know that the people around me also contribute to that business. So it is very important to make sure that there is a shared ownership to the success of the overall business. Um, teams also uh, are collaborative. Uh, they are, they discuss ideas, they bring them together, they work together. They are often working to that common goal. So I may have a piece of the solution, you might have a piece of the solution, but when we put them together, it's, it's amazing. Um, I'm able to achieve anything because we bring those ideas together. And I think what we're also seeing today with uh, even our three levels of government in the Toronto area, we see three sets of leaders who on a good day don't always agree. We can cite all kinds of examples where uh, Trudeau doesn't agree with Ford, Ford doesn't agree with uh, Tory. Um, but what we are seeing today is three leaders who under a common goal to get us through this sort of pandemic that we're experiencing, they are trying to find their common vision, their common agreement, their common goals for each level that they operate uh, in bringing us all through this. So um, those are things that, that's a, I think an example where we're seeing people who typically would would function very individually or differently coming together around something that uh, we want to overcome. And, and there's a common outcome that they're really working towards, um, although their means might be slightly different. Um, they're, they're functioning well. And I think it comes from the fact that in teams, and when you're working as a team, uh, there is trust. Um, I trust uh, that you know, I can share an idea. I trust that you will get the work done that you need to get done. Um, I am allowed to disagree because we know that disagreement brings up better ideas sometimes. Uh, we can find that common thread to another way. We are able to express feelings in a healthy way. I'm, I'm, um, I'm not sure how to get that thing done or um, I, I feel excited about the fact that I got a good idea. You know, we want, we want that all to be there, but we want it to be done with respect, um, always. Um, when you are sharing information, um, then, um, you will be able to, um, also, um, you know, have common understanding. So when you're communicating really well in a business, and I know I'm over, like communications is all through this. Um, you know, it is a reality that when you are communicating well um, on all levels uh, that uh, you are able to have open dialogue, it can be honest. Um, and then you also want uh, common understanding will also get us to a place where we can um, share a, a common idea. We can get to that place where um, we, uh, there we are, thank you. Um, where, uh, you know, we can express different viewpoints. Um, we also know that in uh, developing teams, uh, personal development is key. Um, I think that one of the things I learned very early on in my career is that sometimes employees expect you as the employer to develop them. Um, I would argue that it is a collaborative effort. I think that employees who want to grow their careers and their experiences have a mutual obligation to you to spend some time on their own doing that. But I also know that employers, in order for you to scale uh, your businesses, today I may need someone who is an intermediate level developer, um, or I may need someone who's good at um, dealing with those customer issues. Um, but at some point in the future, I need that person to also be able to lead a team uh, of people who are developers or lead a customer success team. Um, and so I need to have them develop, but I also want them to develop. Um, so finding those paths where we can have them learn and we also uh, are able to uh, provide on the job training. Sometimes it's in the form of uh, work assignments, uh, projects. Uh, sometimes it's even them going to meetups and some of the other places that they can go to to learn and grow. Uh, it is important. 
I know for me at one point in my career when I was early in HR, uh, my VP of HR uh, had what I called the drag along. Um, and I still use it myself today often. Uh, the drag along was that when my boss, Marnie Faulkner, went to work uh, on projects or into meetings, she dragged me along. And so what I started to learn was more about the business. Um, I learned more about uh, the clients we served. Uh, I also started learning more about how the people fit into that uh, business. And so as a consequence of that, um, I learned a lot. Uh, sometimes I was taking minute notes in a meeting. Sometimes uh, as I progressed in my, my uh, learnings, um, I was able to take on more responsibility in those meetings. And eventually I ran the meetings, uh, which was always her intent. So we can find a lot of different ways to support growth and development uh, in uh, our businesses. Conflict re res resolution. Well, sometimes it's been my experience when I work as an individual or I see my business or my department group uh, kind of in a silo, um, I'm not as willing to collaborate. I'm not as willing to give in to ideas or thoughts um, or other ways of doing things. Um, but when you are part of a team, uh, members are, um, you know, uh, you know, more willing to look at how do we get to a solution. Um, so I may disagree on uh, means of getting something done, but often what happens in healthy teams is I know what the end game is. I know where we have to go. Sometimes those conflicts come out of the differences in our roles in a business um, and what we need to achieve. But often we can find that common place where we can both together kind of move forward um, into resolving the conflict, coming up with a healthy solution, and moving forward. So these 10 tips, I hope, will give you just a sense of where you can go uh, and things to think about when you are building teams. Because sometimes when I'm meeting with some of the leaders at the DMC, I know they struggle with how people get along at times. Um, and it's partly because they're trying to do so many things and they're wearing multiple hats themselves that it's challenging to spend time on any one area. But I hope that this uh, particular section in this presentation will allow you a reference point to go back at times when you see things a little off within your teams and going, okay, what do I think's going on? Maybe what have I got in front of me that I'm dealing with? And sometimes you may realize that you know, you've got people who are slipping back into being uh, groups of individuals. They're not necessarily um, moving forward as a team. Um, and then you may need to spend a bit more uh, uh, time really reflecting on what brings team together. So I hope this will help a lot. When we take a look at uh, decision making um, and, and clear leadership, um, these are kind of really interesting areas for me uh, working with new leaders because uh, what I find is that, um, you know, in a smaller based business where you have the opportunity to spend time uh, talking to each other, to think about what has to be done, um, you know, I think people always, always appreciate that. And often people come to businesses like yours um, because they do want to have that opportunity to learn about. Uh, making decisions and being a leader and do, touching different parts of a business. So I think this becomes a really interesting area. Um, when you are, um, you know, not necessarily functioning in a healthy way as a team, um, decision making can be very broken. Um, and I've seen that many times. I can think of examples uh, immediately where um, you know, I've had uh, technical leaders who have a particular viewpoint um, on what the technology should look like, it should be from their perspective. Whereas a salesperson who is asking for things to be a little different because the user experience is a little different. And um, you know, sometimes those do become win-lose situations. Um, one person gets it because it's more customer centric. The other person wins the battle because technology says this is how it should be. 
when there probably should be more gray and more blended approach to the solution because that's the reality is that often our technical leaders know exactly what the product can do or can't do uh, but it needs to be blended with what that customer needs and sometimes because they're so focused on building the product they don't have as much time in front of the customer so that does become a challenge um, and then when we do have times where uh, we have to look at which is more important, is it going to be around the customer or is it going to be around the product, we do need clear leaders. Um, and so that becomes an important place for you yourselves as leaders to be able to um, help to guide the team into a decision making process that has consensus around it. Um, and it's probably one of the, the more difficult skills because as leaders, sometimes we just want to dictate um, when in fact, what we should be doing is using our influencing skills, our, our team leadership capabilities to really bring consensus to that, that decision that's being made. Um, groups of people around commitment you know honestly that will be uh i would say very individualistic um you know uh teams often are committed to to the greater good sometimes so if your product is providing greater good to uh the um the the community uh to people at large um, you will often see teams are are there in your business for that purpose. They know that you can create a greater good. So if I'm a company like uh, Blue Dot right now um, in Toronto, I'd be feeling really good about things because there's a business that you know started out on a path to solve a problem, and today you know they're being approached by governments all over the world to help because they're able to look at the data that tells us about. Uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus, as well as other types of viruses out there. We've got another company, DMZ History, um, Inkblot. You know, that, there's another great business out there where people can rally around it, um, you know, because of the, the business and the, the problems they're solving with people in mental health. So people will come together, um, you know, around those, uh, those types of things. They'll also come around it for uh, the leader um, and, and the types of end products that you're, you're uh, building because they have a common interest in them as well. So we know that uh, there's a lot of reasons why people can uh, you know, come together in, in a workplace around uh, and make it har harmonious um, for sure. Um, when things are, leaders aren't around, uh, they're not participating, um, you know, uh, I can tell you, I can cite you many examples uh, where uh, the business breaks down and probably isn't as successful as it could be. Um, so individualism is, is great. Uh, it brings us a diversity of ideas and thoughts, but also those same individuals, um, you know, bringing their ideas into a team where there is a common end purpose. Um, is also uh, a better thing when you're trying to build a business. Change slide. Um, so I'm gonna go through just a couple things that will uh, help you with um, managing uh, some teams uh, for those that haven't done it before. Um, the one nice thing for a lot of technology companies is you've either probably worked uh, as a remote uh, a contributor in a business in previous lives or um, you know you may already have some experience in this regard, but I think at the end of the day, you know there's some common sense things that happen here. And um, you know I'm watching um, people, clients, and uh, businesses and industries that aren't as familiar with this uh, try and figure it out today. Um, so again, uh, communications. Uh, so communications, communications, communications. I mean, what can I say? You know that's a big thing. Um, using tools that are out there, um, Slack, um, Microsoft have some good products today, Team and, and some of those, um, you know, taking a look at your platforms uh, around how people work. Um, that's probably one of the biggest challenges I find is that uh, people have not really always thought through how, how do you keep your teams uh, together? Uh, so using Slack and things like that, I think is, is really important. Um, 
being able to have uh, shared information through technology, I think is always helpful. Um, having the right uh, abilities to go into uh, a corporate system, knowing that your firewalls are set up and all of the technology that you need to protect the things that you are working on, but also know that people can work from other places uh, to, to do the work uh, is important as well. So that, that becomes important. I think having um, a version of the da daily standup um, starting each meeting with a purpose uh, is important. So I think uh, when we are working alone, what we miss are those kind of moments uh, where we can whiteboard an idea, where we can uh, have a quick conversation uh, with colleagues uh, around something we're working on. Um, you know, someone taps me on the shoulder uh, and we, we have a, a bit of a team conversation as well. Um, so I think being able to um, stand up to um, kind of give context to what a online meeting can be about, um, to be able to have uh, things that you can share ideas, you can chat, you can post thoughts uh, are important. Um, and being able to reaffirm what the goals are uh, for that, that day, that week, that month um, are always important as well because it, it allows people to have a sense of the uh, work to be done, um, the milestones you want to achieve, and how they can contribute to that success. And I do believe today with all that is going on in the world, um, you know, people today uh, have a lot to deal with for sure. Um, so while I'm at home, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to set myself up in a place that works, have technology that works, um, you know, um, things that, you, that you're trying to do, uh, any place where you can start to uh, give them a purpose for the day, a purpose for the week. Um, to be able to coach and guide um, through things like Slack is important. Uh, to know that the technologies are set up in a way that they're functioning and they're capable of allowing the person to do the work, I think is, is all good stuff. Um, and so it's places where you want to spend the time. You know, taking uh, advantage of Zoom and some of these other products, um, you know, are always good, um, you know, to be able to bring people together. Um, in one of the companies I used to work with, our management team was half in the United States and half in Canada. And uh, our CEO at the time, uh, he had, um, everybody had to be at the meeting. Um, and the reality was that, um, you know, you could have your systems on like this, um, but um, you could not be doing other work. So he watched very carefully at your engagement in the meetings and the things that we were doing. Um, the only person who was allowed to sort of sidetrack during meetings was our sales executive. So that if deals were um, in motion, he was still able to kind of function through a meeting. But uh, a lot of our communications happened uh, verbally uh, through those meetings. We could see each other's expressions. Uh, we could communicate well, both not just verbally, but in the context of our body language and those other things. Um, so it is uh, an important thing to be using. Um, and I will say that the muting um, in these systems is always good. I remember once having a colleague who was uh, getting into a cab in India and um, he had forgotten to mute. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of noise going on. We had horn honking and all kinds of stuff. Um, so uh, it is my, you know, it's always important to be mindful of those background uh, things. Um, having some structure around your meetings, knowing what you want to achieve in them, um, the outcomes, things like that are good. And, um, you know, keeping the multi-channel uh, communications going on. I think being able to communicate through the day uh, and knowing that your team is accessible. So if I'm working remotely or if I'm working from home, it doesn't mean I put my system on so I look like I'm there, but then I don't really hang out and get my work done through the day or I can't be reached. When you're working remotely, it is important to make sure that your teams have a good setup at home to be able to work without distractions. Um, so it is being able to understand 
you know, what have you shared with them related to the work and the things that you want to achieve? How have, what do they need to do to, to achieve those things through the day or the week? And then, you know, the following week, you are doing a little bit of a roundup on the work from last week. So we're reflecting back a little bit on last week. We're bringing us forward into this week. Um, but you're also being mindful of what is getting achieved when people are working remotely. Um, you know, there's always two streams of thought on this. There will be those that will think that anybody working from home is not working. Um, it's not been my experience that that has been the case. Um, we do see it for sure. Um, it does happen, but I would say generally people are looking uh, to be successful and to contribute. I think the problem sometimes is that working from home can be tough. I'm not used to it. I feel isolated. Um, you know, I may have challenges in how I can set my systems up. So I think as leaders, when we do see uh, poor performance in a remote uh, setting environment for work, um, it is always important to first understand what's going on um, and then see if you can help that individual set up a better framework around themselves for when they are working uh, from home. Um, I think there will be individuals who uh, will do it quite successfully and then others that uh, will not be as successful. So I know for myself in my home, um, when I have things like this going on, I have two very noisy dogs very noisy dogs. Um, and so uh, if I stay on in that part of my home, then uh, all you would hear are two yappy dogs and you probably see them right about here. Um, so for me, I have to go to another room. I have to be able to shut it down and close it off. So we sometimes do need to guide people uh, through these things so until they get to that place where, where they're able to function. Um, and I think uh, leading in, in crisis, I mean, we are working uh, in very unusual times right now. So uh, I think as we also start to uh, look at these very fundamental and basic things, I think uh, every day uh, we have to come to work with understanding um, as leaders. Uh, we need to be able to help people uh, move forward because I think some of the challenges that uh, we're seeing is that if we have a TV going, as I do right now, so that I can keep up on things that are going on, and I think by nature we're, we're all wanting to know what's going on, um, that can be a burden um, when we're listening to this type of information all day long. So I think being able to also help employees set out objectives, to be able to set up a workplace that allows me to focus on my work um, is important. And I think you know, that those are some of the things that you can be doing. I think what we also want to be able to do is uh, understand that uh, family and, and, and friends and, uh, and neighbors and the things that are going on around us will also be affecting us. So uh, we may have uh, children at home. Uh, we may have family uh, that is staying with us through these times. It's being able to help understand those types of things and being a little bit flexible when it comes to working arrangements. Uh, we may find that some of our workers uh, do need to spend some time with um, their family and children at the beginning of a day, but may find that in the later day to the evenings, uh, they have more flexibility of time. So we may need to be a little bit uh, flexible uh, uh, around the arrangements we have with people related to the other things that they're dealing with in their worlds today. Um, so we want to seek to understand first, we want to clarify and then where we can help to work to, together to collaboratively come up with a, a way of solving the problem will also be important. Um, so those are some of the things that uh, I would say that, you know, when you're building team, uh, working remotely uh, are important to keep in mind. Um, and then um, what I'll do is um, uh, I'll kind of wrap up this part of the discussion right now. I'll go back to Emily. Um, and then if you want me to answer, que answer questions related to this or some of the things that we're dealing with uh, today as far as dealing in a crisis, uh, I'm happy to do that as well. So we have a couple of questions here on the YouTube channel and uh, we'll welcome anyone else to add a question if they are thinking of one and they haven't added it yet. 
The first question says, what are best practices for managing remote teams across large time zones? For example, our tech team is in India, 9.5 hours behind Toronto. Yes, yeah, so um, that's always a challenge. So um, in one company I used to work with, uh, what we actually did is our North American group uh, worked on pieces of the product uh, through our time zone days. Um, and then uh, typically either around, I would say seven in the morning or seven in the evening, um, what we typically did was a group call um, where we would uh, debrief on the work that had been done uh, through say the day uh, and was potentially being transitioned to the team that was uh, sitting in India as the, their day started. Um, so we often found a common time where it wasn't perfect for everybody by a long shot, but it worked for most people. And that's when we tried to bring uh, the team together to be able to debrief on work that had been done and work that was uh, to go on through uh, the next stage. And often they took on that next level of development. So what you may want to do is if your dev teams in India where they're in one time zone, um, and you have key people here uh, that also need to be aware of what's going on and how it's being done. Um, you may want to start to set up uh, a common time that works for both groups um, to be able to connect um, on a regular basis. So people are getting that consensus. The, the other way you do it is that I've also seen done is um, there are uh, completely separate types of meetings that occur. So they're based on functional uh, groupings. So for example, if your development team is in India, then those team meetings, you know, they happen as they need to happen. Um, and then uh, every two to three, you know, two to four weeks, um, there would be a common meeting where everybody did come together on that common call. Um, it's very diff much more difficult when you have um, smaller teams uh, to do that. Um, but I think when you uh, can find a common time uh, that pretty much works for everybody and for uh, in the business I was in uh, where we uh, uh, where it was India based, um, um, I was expected to be up at seven in the morning um, to do a debrief call as needed. Um, and to uh, answer questions or transition work. Um, and then uh, once that was sort of completed, then you know they would carry on with, with their day um, and or their evenings. And then I would pick up for the day on the things that I needed to do. And where necessary, then I transitioned at seven in the evening, um, especially if it was tight timelines on things. Um, and then I would transition my work back to them and, and forward. So, so that's one way of approaching it. And I hope I answered the question. Excellent. So we have a couple other questions right now. The next question says, what are your thoughts about hiring during crisis? And what are some of the best practices for onboarding remotely? So um, I think you have to look at your specific business um, and really understand what your hiring requirements are. I can tell you right now, I do know of businesses that are hiring um, because they can anticipate uh, more clearly where their business is going to go. If you are uncertain about where you will be, your business will be in the next 30 or 45 days, it would be my advice to wait uh, for the next few weeks uh, and I would say my, this is in my world, um, I believe I would be waiting till at least mid-April before uh, I started doing any significant hiring if I was not clear about where my business was going to be in, in the next six, 45 to 65 days. Um, I do know that um, for uh, businesses that are much clearer about it, and for some businesses, they, and, and just to be clear, there are businesses out there right now where they can see the revenue. They know where their business is going. They know what they're doing. They know what they need to hire. And, and their, their uh, revenue stream is going to fluctuate a bit, but they can still see that they, they can afford that person that they're going to hire. Um, and, and they are doing that. Um, but for businesses that are a little uncertain, um, they are pulling back. So in some cases, um, which I've been involved with over the last few weeks, uh, there are industries that have had to do significant cuts because the part of their business that um, 
uh, that is sort of people focused or needs that one-on-one -on -one, uh, focus in the retail business, for example, uh, they don't know for sure what that part of the business is going to look like in the next uh, 45 days. So those areas have shut down and they aren't hiring. Now, on the technical sides of their businesses where they have online sales and things like that, we are seeing a little bit of it. Um, so I would say just be cautious uh, and know your business for sure. When you're doing online or uh, remote uh, onboarding, um, I do believe it is way more challenging for sure. But I think it's also important to cover off a lot of the same steps. Whether I work remotely for you or I am in your office, I still need to understand uh, some basic things around what is your business focus? Where are we going? Um, I need to understand uh, sort of those corporate pieces of the organization. What are all of the departments? Where do I find resources? So policies, processes, technologies that are available to me. Where do I find the knowledge I need? And when I say that, um, it's not just called Joe, because here's the deal. Um, when I'm working remotely, I need to know how to get to Joe's brain when he's not around. So it's, it's more important to start to really think about how do I document information or document that information that's in Joe's brain so that when I need it, I know where to find it in my time zone or in my time frames so that I can keep the things going forward because that is probably one of the biggest challenges remote workers have in other time zones is um, I know Joe has that data in his brain, but I can't get to him right now because I know he's asleep or Joe's been the really great person to say, hey, don't worry, just get in touch with me. Well, I'm waking him up all night. Well, that doesn't work either. So I do think um, having uh, a very similar onboarding, although it needs to be remote, if your business can't afford it, I would suggest that you do have that remote worker come into your, your um, headquarters at least uh, for a week to two weeks, if possible, to meet people and to do a really focused approach on those on the ground kinds of training things that they need to have. Otherwise, I would start to look to uh, video conferencing as a means for doing some of that uh, work if you don't have the, the money to really bring them in, do video conferencing and, and really try to cover the same things off. So I always suggest try to do the same things as much as you possibly can. Um, and um, But you're doing it in probably a more condensed version because you're doing it this way. So I hope I answered the question. Excellent, thank you. And I see one other question here and that might be our last question. It says, how early should you bring in personal development programs for a startup? And uh, what would you suggest is a reasonable annual budget per employee for a professional development? So um, I'm a big, uh, I believe uh, personal development should start right away. Um, one of the things we know about people who are going to startups is that they are going for the growth op opportunity. Um, they often are choosing a startup because they can get more uh, a broader range of experiences and exposure to things. So I do think it starts right at the beginning. So um, I, I really do believe that you um, can do this without having to spend tons of money. Um, what I would be doing is probably taking a look again at what is the work that you're hiring them to do. So if we go back to the employee performance slide. So Emily, can you just go back to that uh, slide? I think it's like the second or third slide. Um, you'll find that um, when we take a look at that um, framework, what we're doing is we're taking a look at, you know, what do you need to achieve as a business? Um, then we're taking a look at what are those competencies uh, that you, um, you need to be able to, uh, you know, grow your business in the next, you know, six or 12 months. Um, what we can start to do at that point is anticipate. So you're starting to really think about succession planning forward. So it's thinking about, um, you know, what do I need them to be able to do? And what can I teach them to be better at what I need them to do? Um, but what you can also start to do is think forward a little bit. And so there are always going to be project opportunities or on the job training or experiences that are going to pop up in a startup 
where you can start to get that in, that involvement of that person early on. So uh, you're starting to really scale your capabilities in your business. So I actually think, you know, it's more informal when you do it this way. It's like being a coach. Um, you know, it's like uh, my manager who dragged me along to meetings. It's starting to expose them to the things that they can take on, um, you know, later on as they get more exposure to it. Because the reality is, is that as CEOs and leaders and founders, uh, you can't do everything. You're just not going to be able to do everything. So I say it starts very early on. Um, and then uh, as far as allocating funds to it, um, you know, I'll be honest, there's a lot of data out there that will tell you uh, numbers. The reality in a startup is you have to look at what can you afford. That's the reality. So what you may find is that um, you're going to use more of an approach with uh, the general employee base of, we're gonna teach you to do, have the skills uh, within the job by teaching, showing, trying and checking. So it's a coaching model um, that of, of the things we need you to do in your job today and to move to that next level as a developer or, or whatever that skill base is. Um, in some cases, uh, you may look at a small group of individuals and that may be 10 or 15% uh, of your population and say, I can afford to spend um, you know, $500 or I can spend $1,000 on those employees in the next 12 months to develop them in these specific skills that will take them to the next level of capability because that's something I'm going to need next year. It also will allow them that personal development. And in some cases, you may want to set up a, a shared model so that um, the employee is spending some money towards their development, but so are you. Um, in some businesses, um, I've seen it a 50-50 match. Sometimes I've seen it, you know, 80-20. Um, again, you're going to have to look at the models of where you are at as far as scaling your business, whether you've got investors, you're bootstrapping, you know, what that is, and really figure out what can you afford to do. But I would say um, one of the reasons I look at this model, because I believe no matter how small or large you are, this is every day. This is everyday model and it doesn't cost you anything if you're really taking the approach of being a coach, coaching skills, capabilities, performance to get something done in the business and also scaling those people to the next level of capability that they want and you want. Thank you, Mary Ann. And there's one final question and then we will wrap. And that question says, what is the best method to ensure someone working from home is being productive? What is the best way to track this? So um, there's lots of conversations about that. For sh I mean, if you have tracking tools, there are a lot of tracking tools out there that you can use um, to kind of uh, see what an employee is doing. I personally believe that um, if you're a good manager, what I would be suggesting is that, you know, you are being clear about the uh, deliverables that you need, that you are um, assigning the responsibilities of work to the team in, in the ways that we've suggested today. Um, and then I think what you can be doing is without feeling like you're policing this, what I would be doing is probably setting up a model uh, that says, on a daily basis or on a uh, weekly basis, you would like people to, um, you know, feed back to you, what did they accomplish that week? Um, and, and I think what I'd probably do is set up a framework that sort of says, you know, here were our key objectives for the week of the things that we needed to achieve to take our product forward or, or take the customer forward or whatever that thing was that you wanted to have done. So we're going back to what did we want to achieve? Then the second part of it is you're sharing with me, um, you know, against a milestone. So if that was the milestone we wanted to achieve, what were the things you did today? Or what were the things you did this week that helped us move the needle that way? So help me understand that. And I think it's through understanding what our employees are able to operationally do. We can then take a look at what their success rates are 
And then I think if we see an employee who may be falling down a little bit in their ability to get things done, that's when you go in as a coach uh, and you start to understand what is going on. What is keeping, what is the boulder in front of them or the rock or whatever, you know, that is in front of them that they can't get it done. So we're starting to take a look at, you know, is it too hard for them to work remotely? Uh, you know, not everybody can work remotely. Um, so we're taking a look at that. We're taking a look at, is it the technology? Does something collapse there? Is it the environment they're in? So we're starting to help work through that issue um, in a timely manner. But because we're asking them to kind of give us these updates of where they're at with achieving the things we want to achieve, we're able to see uh, where the work is at and what's happening. And oh, by the way, with top performers, sometimes one of the challenges we have with them is they are the heroes. Um, so I go to them for all kinds of things. So the one thing I may need them to do this week, I didn't. they didn't get done. And they didn't get it done because there were five other things that were all urgent that they absolutely had to be the ones to do. So that's another reason why we want to, you know, develop skills and scale them throughout a business early on, because those people will also get trapped sometimes in not getting the things they really need to get done done because everybody needs them. Um, so we have to be careful of that too. So I think it allows us just a simple way to coach, to monitor performance and uh, be able to support people through this. If you start to ask for reports, I need your report on Friday, or I need your report at the end of the day of what you did. Um, and I need to know when you took lunch and I need to know when you took your smoke break or whatever that thing was, you know, that starts to sound more policing. It doesn't sound collaborative. It doesn't feel like team. So just be thoughtful about how you do that and why you're really doing it um, when you are functioning that way. Thank you, Marianne. That was a great answer. Um, and with that, I think we'll conclude our workshop. But really, we appreciate your time, Marianne, and all of your great advice. Um, if DMT companies have further questions for Marianne, we can try and get you further time to chat with her, chat with your programs, leads. Um, and for our folks in the audience who maybe aren't currently part of the DMZ program, we're having another workshop tomorrow, co-hosted with Ripple Ventures, talking about navigating a crisis and storm, what to do in times of recession and what that means for you, your company, and possible opportunities to fundraise. Um, so please feel free to check that out if you think it will help you. Thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Take care. Be safe.